We'd like to welcome everybody on this Lord's Day to Highland Church of Christ online worship service. We ask that at this time that you put all distractions aside and let's worship our God in song. Let us pray. 
Our fathers, we're coming to you this morning. We thank you for the many wonderful blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for the physical blessings that you've given us, the food, clothing, shelter. Uh, we know that all these good things come from you. Uh, we know we thank you for your love that you have given to us and in the form of your son, uh, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and died and shed his blood that we might have forgiveness of our sins, Father. Uh, we thank you for this church and thank you for those who are worshiping online and uh, pray for the day that we can all be together again, Father. Hope you'll watch over us and protect us and guide us in all things. In Christ's name, amen. In In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, the Apostle Paul is really in the context encouraging the church at Corinth to flee from idolatry. Uh, but, but notice what he says here. He says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as the wise men. Judge for yourselves what, what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of the one bread. And really, the, the interesting thing about this that I really want to hone in on today is he's, he's tying back the fact that of all the things in, in Corinth that were causing divisions, and, and this, this concept of idolatry here, is, is, is there's, we're warned about it time and time again throughout Scripture, particularly here. But Paul is reminding them that every time they take this cup of blessings, uh, it's communion with the blood of Christ, the bread. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. And, and it's interesting because the word communion is the Greek word means koinonia. It is koinonia. And what it means, it's, it's sharing in common. It's, it's togetherness. It, it carries with it this idea of, of oneness. And so every single time we take this cup of blessings, 
this it is the communion. We're communing. We're in fellowship with the blood of Christ. But most of all, we're in fellowship with one another. And additionally, every time we take the bread, it's the same thing. We are in fellowship with one another as a result of that. So let's keep those thoughts in mind today as we as we pray for our communion. Lord God Almighty, thank you for the opportunity for us to share and be partakers in the Lord's Supper, but also, Father, to be sharers and partakers of your body and being uh, able to be together and commune with you and with one another. Father, help us to remember that although, yes, as your word says, we are many members, we are one body, we are one when we do this. And help us, Lord, to know and remember that even though we are separated by distance, we are still in fellowship with one another, especially through a time like this. Thank you for this bread, Father, and uh, thank you so much for Jesus in his name. Amen. Additionally, we pray for the cup. Lord God, thank you so much for the blood of Jesus. Jesus, thank you for this cup. Thank you for suffering on our behalf. Thank you for allowing us through your blood to have fellowship with you and the forgiveness of sins. And ultimately help us to remember that because of that, because of our faith in those things, that we also have fellowship and sharing and together with one another and especially at a time like this when we gather around this cup. It's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, in the same vein as we talk about the idea of sharing together and communing around the the Lord's table and communing communing around the blood and the body, the bread. Uh, what what we also need to think about is the fact that every time we give, we are becoming partakers of the work of this church. We're helping the Lord's cause, and so that's such an important piece of this. So, yes, we give individually, but also let's remember that all of this money gets put together collectively, so we can do greater things for God's. God's church. Thank you so much for being a part of this, and uh, let's pray about it. Lord God, as we uh, come to you this time, and we think about giving, and we think about what we give, Father, help us remember we can never outgive you. Help us to remember, Lord, that every penny that we give toward your work is, is used in a proper way, and is used ultimately, Lord, with the intention of bringing glory to you and spreading your word. Father, help us not to overlook this and help us not to forget it. It's in Jesus' name, amen.
comes to mind when you think about being a servant or serving others? There are several images I think that automatically uh, conjure up in most people's minds. I remember the hit show on uh, PBS a few years ago, several seasons of it actually, and I'll confess I did watch it. It was actually well done. It was, called, it was Downton Abbey. Uh, this was set in uh, the end of the Victorian period in England. These folks had uh, a mansion that was at least the size of our church building here, and they had a number of servants, a, a few dozen servants. And and these people uh, took care of the lady of the house, took care of the family, took care of the man of the house, all of these folks. And, um, you know, we would equivocate them to butlers and maids and things like that now. And most of the storyline revolved around the, the lives of those of those servants. And can you imagine really being in a place where at a time period like that, where we all, you know, get dressed on our own, but you have someone on a daily basis helping you dress, helping you bathe, having the towel laid out, having the soap laid out, waiting on you to get out of the tub and things like that. I mean, that's very much what it was like for these very wealthy people at that time. When we think about servants, Another one that I'm reminded of when I think about servants or serving is the idea of a waiter or waitress. I did this for a number of years. My wife did the same thing. Uh, that's actually what I was doing when I met her. I was working in a restaurant. So was she. And and we remember restaurants, don't we, before the pandemic? And you could actually go into a place and sit down and eat and people would bring you your food and no one ever thought anything about it. Uh, the other idea we have when we think about a servant or a servant is the cleaning crew or the janitor, the custodian, the person that cleans the building here or at a school. I grew up in a small rural community, went to the same elementary school, kindergarten through eighth grade, and I remember Mr. Goundry. Uh, Bob Goundry was our custodian all those years. And one of the things about it was his wife also worked there as an office assistant. And so these people were just fixtures in our lives. They were fixtures in our community. They knew our, our family and other people like that and got to watch us grow up in so many ways. And and so I'm just mindful of that. And every single time somebody got sick or something happened or something was broken, when everybody else is turning away from it, guess who came? Mr. Gowder did. He was the one that always cleaned it up, always did the dirty jobs we didn't really want to do. The other thing that I think about when I am mindful of servants or being a servant is my wife. My wife is very much a servant in her household. Not that it's a role that we force upon her, but she willingly takes it. And moms and wives have a unique way of just being servants naturally in, uh, to their families and in their families. And of course, husbands do too. But the thing about being a servant is it's not that we think about this idea and suddenly we're immediately seeing it as glamorous and exciting. They always make the front pages, the headlines. Uh, they, they don't always make the most money. They don't always live in the biggest houses or anything like that. And they don't always have the greatest jobs either. I mean, by default... They're a little lower than the ones they're serving. And again, they're the ones that are cleaning up things and doing the things that nobody else wants to do, the dirty jobs. And after all, who really wants to do that in the end? You know, it's not really within our nature inherently to want to serve others. I know some people are just better at it than other people. But when we talk about the church's mission and purpose, as we look at it from a biblical perspective, it's obviously that service to others is a big, big part of what God wants his people to be and what he wants his people to do is to serve other people. I'm mindful of passages like Galatians 5, 13, serve one another in love. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul reminds us to not lag behind or be diligent in our service to others and ultimately to God. Christianity is very much an act of religion. We're to be doers of God's word. We're to be goers uh, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But unfortunately, 2020 and the pandemic that's happened around COVID-19, uh, it's really turned it into a lot of sitting and staying. We've really had to sit and stay put in so many ways. And so this year has brought some unprecedented challenges and changes. So much about what we do around worship and church itself is just so very, very different now. If you just look at our auditorium, uh, there, like literally more than half of the chairs in there uh, have been have been removed to allow social distancing, and we're doing two services, and so so many things look and feel differently. But that does not mean that the church is on the downslide. That does not mean that God's people are done. It doesn't mean that the church is out of order, or that the church is closed, or that the church no longer has a purpose. Because the truth of the matter is. 
The need for serving others now is just as big as it's ever been. It may look different, it may feel different, and we may by necessity have to do things differently. But again, when we think about serving others and reaching out by serving others, there is still a big need. So in light of what's happened this year, in light of the way things have changed and are changing, I really want us to try to change our mindset by looking beyond the building, looking beyond the pandemic, looking beyond right now, looking beyond ourselves, and really think seriously about the importance of serving others and reaching out and what we can accomplish when we do so. One of the things I want to share with you first is the idea about motivation. The motivation for service is always so important. The motive behind why we're doing things is always a big deal. Sometimes it can greatly uh, it, it can greatly change things in people's lives. Mainly, I'm thinking about serious court cases. Uh, if there's a criminal case, the innocence or guilt of a person sometimes depends on the motivation behind their action. Did they do this intentionally, or was it ruled an accident? Same thing happened in the end, but why? What was the motivation behind it? That's so important. When I think about serving God, there always needs to be an examination for motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? I think about my children, and oftentimes uh, a couple of my boys, my youngest one in particular, is not highly motivated to serve, uh, not highly motivated rather, to clean his room. Oh, yes, we talk about it. It gets done. But, but his effort and motivation and behind it is often lacking, as you can imagine, is common with most children, of course. And yet, he, he, when he does it, he doesn't do it because he's like, oh, I need to clean my room. I'm so excited about it. He does it simply because he's made to do it. And, and the motivation behind it is often, often wrong. But again, when we talk about serving God, let, let me share with you a couple of, of, of motivations to serve God. First, I want to start by looking at the wrong motives. Here are some reasons that should not be what motivates us to serve God. The first one is the idea of legalism. This is the idea of having to do this because I, I, I don't really want to, or drudgery, a sense of obligation. It's, it's the idea of, oh, man, if I, if I don't do this, I'm, I've got to do it. I don't really want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyways. You know, that sounds like going to work on Monday morning to me, for most people, uh, that, that, that very idea. And so when we think about serving God, and if that's our motivation, this sense of obligation, this legalism, trying to earn one salvation or doing something to be acceptable of God, we've totally missed the point. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Titus, uh, Paul reminds us there that uh, God saved us, not on the basis of righteous deeds that we have done, uh, but, but when you look at this, there's never this thing with God where he looks at us and says, oh, that's that one thing you did. Oh, there's that, that, that's the reason why I saved this guy. That's the reason why I let her become a Christian. I brought salvation to her. That, because that, that one moment right there, or those moments, it's never like that with God. And really, that's mostly misunderstanding about God. Another uh, improper motivation, wrong motive rather, is guilt. Guilt is, I'll feel really bad if I don't do this. It's a guilty conscience. So in turn, I need to do something good to make God happy. Well, you've missed the point again because eventually... What happens with that is that we, is that we avoid the source of our guilt. The next thing is the idea of self-seeking, doing things that promote me. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew chapter six concerning the Pharisees and a lot of their actions. Uh, Matthew six, he talked about how they were do things to be seen of men, and he says, "I'm telling you, if that's why they're doing it. There's their reward. There's no credit with God in doing that." So service is never really about what others will think of me, and never make it about yourself. So we've seen some wrong motivations for service. Let me share some right motivations. I think the highest motive behind serving God and serving other people, the highest motivation of all is love. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God reminds us that in, while, in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That whole passage, Romans 5, 6 through 10, God explains to us how he, Paul explains to us how God really went out of his way to demonstrate his own love toward us. He was willing to show us how much he really loved us by allowing Jesus to go to the cross. And Jesus, in turn, the same thing, was showing, this is how much I love you by doing that. And so, in turn, when we understand God's love for us, it will help us better love God and love other people because you really can't love God without loving others. 
Another thing is the, another good motivation is a sense of gratitude. Gratitude is the desire to respond favorably to kindness shown you. You begin to recognize what God has done. We see in Colossians 1.20, uh, Paul writes that God has reconciled all things to himself through the cross. And, and there's a thankfulness that begins to encompass all things that we do in life. Another motivation, of course, for serving God is his grace. Grace is getting what we do not deserve and are never worthy of. That's, that's salvation. But yet, at the same time, serving people through the motive of grace is never earning our salvation, but acting in appreciation of it. And the final motivation is this. Think about this. We don't talk a lot about this, but really it's, it's eternal significance. The truth of the matter is, is that when we serve others, assuming we have the right motivation behind it, we get to play a major role in God's eternal plan for mankind and the world. Serving God is something that has a great impact on eternity. Because at the end of the day, what we do for him is really the only thing that matters and really the only thing that has eternal significance. So we've seen the motivation of service. Don't do it out of a sense of guilt. Don't do it out of a sense of obligation. But instead, do it out of a gratitude, grace, eternal significance. So now let's go to the great example. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 10 for just a minute, beginning in verse 35 and following. And let's, know, let's move now from the motivation of service to the Messiah of service. What is Jesus' view of, of, of service? How did Jesus view this among his disciples? What did he expect? Well, if you remember in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 35, uh, that, that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they come to him and ask him, Jesus, will you do whatever we want for you? Will you do us a favor, is what they're asking. And Jesus says, sure, what is it? And they say, look, when, when, when you come into this kingdom thing, when the kingdom is all done and you have, as would have been expected, rebuilt the temple and vanquished all our enemies, and you're sitting on this literal throne of Israel like some great king of the past, that would have been the, what they were thinking. Can we be your, sit on your right and your left hand? Can we be your, 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 your top advisors? Can we be your right hand men? If you think about a, an important presidential cabinet position, can we be cabinet members, high-level members of, 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 your, uh, of, of your kingdom here? And Jesus, of course, explains and clears up some misunderstanding about this to him. And later in verse 41, the Bible says the others heard this and they were indignant. They're very upset about it. They don't appreciate they're mad about, it, about what James and John is, uh, are asking and what, what's going on here. And so notice... Notice what takes place in verse, uh, verse 41 or 42. Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, they, they lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, the interesting thing about all of this is really is the fact that notice what Jesus said. If you want to be great in the kingdom, greatness in God's kingdom is not about how many people are serving you and getting one over on other people and climbing the, the ladder, so to speak. It's through being a servant. So the way up in God's kingdom is down. It's through humble Submissive service. And our great desire to be recognized among others has to be channeled into humble service. I remember years ago, I knew a guy that had, that had uh, spent some time in the Air Force, and he was, a, he was a, a high-ranking officer. And he recalled a time when he went to a meeting, and there were a lot of higher-ranking, uh, you know, general-level um, officers there and he remembered like the highest ranking officer he, this guy would have been like a two or three star general at the time this guy was going to be leading the meeting and those kind of things very important role here in all of this so literally the guy is is outranking everybody virtually everybody in this whole situation in this room here and when he went into the room he noticed at the back of the room there stood this this general mind you and you know what this guy was doing he was at the refreshment table and he was pouring coffee for other people, serving other people. And he really thought about the mentality this guy had. That, that really is why he felt very much this guy was in the position he was in because he was not too good to do something for someone else, even though he had this high position. 
As we've seen Jesus' view of service, and we talked about the fact that if you want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to be a servant. Well, as if he hadn't already said enough and marked in, that could have been it. Jesus takes it even further, and now we see his actions. And he turned for a few moments, if you will, over to the book of uh, John, chapter 13. And so in the upper room, literally hours from the cross, Jesus in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, spending his final hours with his disciples before he's betrayed and arrested and all those things that lead up to the cross. In those chapters there, these are like deathbed moments in the sense of, you know, when someone is on their deathbed and, hey, go in there and say your final goodbyes and you draw them in close and you've got one more thing I want you to know. That's the kind of stuff Jesus is talking about. We see this very intimate personal portrait of Jesus and what he wants from his disciples in these last few hours. And, and in the middle of all of that, an old argument according to Luke's account in Luke 22, verses 22 to 20, 24 to 26 breaks out. And it's this argument about who's the greatest. They literally, in the shadow of the cross, start arguing amongst themselves, debating, if you will, about who's the greatest. And Jesus corrects some of their misunderstanding with similar passage to what he just said in Mark 10. But then Jesus takes it even dramatically further. Jesus proves his point by his actions. Jesus goes forward, he grabs the towel, and he begins to wash feet. We're all familiar with this, but but foot washing was a hygienic thing. People wore open-toed sandals or went barefoot, and you come in someone's house, you would wash your feet as a sign of hygiene and a cultural thing too. Social equals would have washed your own feet. But really, if someone else was washing your feet, they were a servant. They were a slave. It was reserved for the lowest person on the totem pole. And yet, the sinless Son of God never thought he was too good to wash feet and serve. And you know who else's feet he washed? Even the feet of Judas. As you go on later in John's account there, he tells Judas what you're going to do. Go, go ahead and do what you're going to do. I know what you're up to, but go ahead and go do it anyways. Even washed his feet. So finally, I want to look at Jesus' mindset. I think when you turn over to Philippians chapter 2, we have so much that's said here in a very concise passage about the mindset, the attitude of Christ. Notice what's said beginning in verse 5. Paul digs deep to reveal to us what Jesus thought about his role while here upon earth. Verse 5 said, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, everything that makes God God was equal and, re and equally present in Jesus. Jesus didn't consider robbery to be equal with God. He didn't consider that 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 it was something that he was missing out on, that it was something that he had to hold on to, he, and, and then he couldn't give up. But he gave up equality with God and made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a bond servant, took on the form of a servant. And coming a likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice, equality with God, everything that makes God, God was present in Jesus. And he gave up the glory of heaven and let it all go to come to earth and willingly took on the role of a human being, but in that role was a servant to humanity and mankind was never self-promoting or getting all the attention. Instead, he made it about other people. He made it about God. Even his death was never about him. And so the mind of Christ was motivated by humility. Because of humility, he submitted, he served, and he suffered. So now we've seen the motivation for service. Don't let serving God be about guilt, a sense of obligation, or or a, a sense of just, I, I have to do this, this, this duty. Instead, let it be about, because you love God and you understand what God did for you in showing his love. Let it be about an appreciation for God's grace. Let it be about the impact for eternity you get to make. Think about the view Jesus had, the Messiah of service himself. How Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. 
how Jesus himself took up on that role in John 13 and, and washed feet. And additionally, how Jesus himself always saw himself in the role of a servant, according to Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11, even serving others through his death. But now, let me bring this home for us. What about the message of service? Let me share you some things that, that, that service says about me personally and about you personally whenever we serve others. The great goal of Christianity is to conform to the image of God's dear Son, to be as much like Him as we possibly can. That's Romans 8 and verse 29. We're to follow His example in all things. And so assuming the proper motives and the desire to follow Jesus, service shows our love for God. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And what does that leave out? Does that leave out anything, including being a servant? It tells others that we don't just believe in Jesus, that we live Jesus. Additionally, it shows that we are serious about God. It shows that we are serious about our faith. It shows that we are not selfish or self-centered, that we care about others. It shows that things important to Jesus are important to us individually and us as the church. It encourages others to want to be more involved. So it shows your love for God. It tells others we, that we really believe in Jesus and we live Jesus, that we're serious about God and our faith. We're not selfish or self-centered. The things important to Jesus are important about to us. And, and others will want to be more involved. They'll be encouraged to do so. So that's that's what service says about me. But let's take it a step further. What does service say about the church? Do you realize that a lot of people have had negative attitudes toward religion in the church? And, and, and very much for, for good reason, uh, because sometimes people have had very little experience with, with religion or especially Christianity, and might I add biblical Christianity at that. Some have been burned by it, mistreated, misled, mistrusted. We've seen people that have grossly misrepresented the faith who have called themselves ministers or servants and things like that. And so people begin to see those people, those examples, and think, I, I don't want any part of that. And I can see why and how people end up in those places. The thing about it is, though, really, when, when, when people see the church reaching out by serving others, it says a lot. It begins to change attitudes about the church, about Jesus, and about Christianity in general. It helps people see the need for Jesus in their lives. There was a time in my life, maybe in the early 80s or so, or at least 30, 40 years ago in this nation, when we could kind of safely assume most people knew that they needed Jesus. That's not the case anymore. We can no longer safely assume that most people realize it. To those of us who are Christians, it, it just becomes second nature. We, we, we already know this. This is so, uh, so mundane, so foundational, so, um, so key to who we are. We already know this. We hear this all the time, yes. But so many people do not realize that. Additionally, it shows that we're not a bunch of hypocrites and we're not just a group of people who are against everything. Christians are really known more for what they're against than what they actually stand for oftentimes. It shows that, that we care about others and are interested in their lives, that we are serious about Jesus, and it can and will open the opportunity for the gospel to be preached to others. You see, we all want the church to grow. We all want others to come to Christ. We do need to take care of our own. We do need to focus inwardly, but the church's overall mission will never fully be achieved or realized if we do not focus outwardly also. You know, one way for us to have an outward focus is by reaching out and serving others. As we think about this idea and we think about the challenges that are presented in 2020, especially and right now, think about this. Could we take food, some of our sick or shut in? There are many people who have not been to church or really out any because of the pandemic. And I would guarantee that if you were to make some food or some Christmas goodies or holiday goodies or something like that, and you were to call them up and say, hey, listen, I'm bringing this over. I can leave it on your porch. I guarantee they would take it and be greatly appreciative of it. You can invite others into your home. You can invite others to church. You can mow a yard, rake leaves, clean the house, offer to watch the kids, feed the dog, whatever. Visit the sick and shut in in ways that are appropriate. 
There are many, many ways to serve and many opportunities. And the question is this, are you looking for them? Are you reaching out by serving others? Let's pray about this. Lord God Almighty, we recognize and acknowledge your greatness. We recognize and acknowledge the role that Jesus played and how he was a servant, an example he set forth. And Lord, I believe that every single one of us, we want to serve. We, we want to please you. We want to serve you. Lord, help us to find the opportunities, see those opportunities, and, and Lord, help us to capitalize on them. Father, help us to be your hands and your feet in this world in greater ways. Help us, Lord, to be servants. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name, His love is burning in our hearts like living.